grateful that you have all come for this special presentation by Rabbi Bill Hamilton. You're in for a real treat. Tonight, I have the privilege of introducing Bernie Pucker, who will introduce tonight's speaker, his rabbi. The Pucker Family Fund from the Pucker Gallery in Boston is the sponsor of this Art and Spirituality series that honors our monastery's late artist in residence, Brother Thomas, and Erie Benedictine sisters, Joe Chittister and Maureen Tobin. Bernie has shared that he and Brother Thomas worked together and corresponded almost daily via fax, when not in person. In Bernie's own words, and I quote, For us, Brother Thomas was indeed a brother, a member of our family. He has been a guide, a resource, a mentor, a traveling companion, and an honored presence of the spirit of our experiences. Through his art and with his words, Thomas inspired us to grow spiritually and to live fully. Through Thomas's art and his own words, he encouraged each of us to seek that which is true, that which unites and does not divide. I now invite Bernie to introduce his friend and rabbi, Rabbi Bill Hamilton. Thank you, Bernie. Simply being here with you brings back so many memories. As some of you may or may not know, um, when Thomas was diagnosed um, with terminal cancer uh, in December 2006, I was in Jerusalem. And I called him because I knew that he had passed out. And I asked him what had happened. He explained to me and he said, someone stopped my marriage go around and they didn't ask him. And never during the ensuing eight months, which was seven months longer than he was given to live, did he ever utter any sense of regret. And he said to me at one time at an elegant place called Tim Hortons here in Erie <laughs> that he was at peace because he knew he was going to a better place. So that alone may help you understand the quality of the human being that has so informed our lives and the lives of all who have been privileged to come in contact with his art and the legacy now that he has left. This is legacy of beauty and the art itself. And then in Boston, there's the Brother Thomas Fund that was established at his request, essentially, to help and benefit struggling artists. I was talking tonight with others about it. There are 95 artists in the city of Boston since 2009 that have received the Brother Thomas Fellowship, which is not only a designation, but also an award of $15,000, which has, in many instances, saved careers of artists many of whom have told me that they would have stopped their practice were it not for this essentially endorsement and support and suddenly other things opened up for them so if he had ever been here to realize the amount of good that that one idea of walking struggling artists has done i think he would even be smiling i just want to share a couple of quotes from thomas uh, bill do the same thing uh, we have published five day books, which has a quote of Thomas's for each of 52 weeks in the year. There's now essentially 260 of his quotes available in those day books. But one of them is the routine of life holds us in readiness for the events of the soul. And in Hebrew, the word for soul is neshama or nefesh. Neshama really deals with the notion of breath life itself, the ability to live and survive. And somehow Thomas in our correspondence, I'll 
always encouraged me and then all of us, Sue and I and all around us, to embrace that idea that each day, Zahayom, from the Psalm in 1824, this is the day the Lord has made. And my rabbi in Kansas City, Rabbi Addis, translated it, and let us uh, accept it, embrace us with joy and gladness. And I think that that lesson comes very strongly through in Thomas's teachings to us. He wrote, each day is filled with a continued discovery and of goodness. What an opportunity for me, for all who ever encountered him or his work or his teachings, to realize that each day provides us with this unique opportunity but to both discover and to discover goodness. In a world that is fraught with a lot of difficulties and destructions and sadness and illness and loss, the idea of being able to think about and concentrate on goodness is an incredible gift. Thomas was certainly that. In the first book of his work that we published was called The Path to the Beautiful. And people understood that to be a physical beauty. But if you knew Thomas and saw his work, then you realized that what he was speaking about was an internal beauty. And Rabbi Bell represents that in so many wonderful ways. The quality of human humanness and humanity in his practice and his presence in our lives and in the lives of the entire community in which we're part of is a gift. So the opportunity simply to have asked him, if he would, to speak about art and spirituality, which is probably essentially a nosh for him. As a rabbi, has so many other chores, the whole profession has changed. And to just reflect on the idea of beauty, art, and how it informs our lives, but also how it informs our spirit. And finally, among Bill's favorites is probably Aaron Joshua Heschel. And probably my favorite quote from Heschel is to celebrate is to contemplate the singularity of the moment and to enhance the singularity of itself. What was shall not be again. And this evening is a perfect example of that. That those of us who are present for it experience it. And it can be recorded and shared with others but the idea of being present, he named me, I am here, is really a gift. So Bill, I'm grateful to you for taking on this opportunity and challenge, and grateful to all of you in the community that brings back so many members to Sue and I, and how loved and appreciated and valued Thomas was. And I can only tell you that his legacy continues to grow in the world in such a remarkable way with no PR, with no advertising agent. It's the quality of the goodness of his spirit that continues to inform the lives of so many people. So thank you. And Bill, you're up. I just want to say to you, dear Bernie, that that was beautiful and loving. I want to say thank you for the honor of being here. Thank you, Sister Stephanie, Sister Anne, all who are here. I saw Sister Joan earlier. It's been an honor to meet so many of you. I want to thank the sisters, along with Brother Thomas, of blessed memory, since arriving just hours ago. Your hospitality has made me feel like family, lending added meaning to being sisters and brothers in faith. To Sue and Bernie, for three decades now, your family has been as my own. The inspiration you've been to me as dear friends 
in faith and works and service, in helping me keep the plot of what we're here to do and why, is surpassed only by my love and affection for you. And also this, thank you, dear Sue and Bernie, for making a lifetime of generosity into a work of art. I've learned that St. Benedict founded the monastic Benedictine tradition in the year 529, the common era. And that was also a year I did a little more research when there was a lot of tumultuous time in the church. Indeed, the Church of Nativity in the Holy Land was burned down that year, which may explain an inviting opportunity for the formation of monastic expressions of faith. I've also learned that this remarkable setting, the Benedictine Sisters of Erie, traces its roots back to St. Walburg Abbey, founded in Bavaria, Germany, in 1035. That's about the same time when rabbinic Judaism, from which I descend, first met the French biblical commentator known as Rashi whose peerless capacity to bring the rabbinic imagination to the Bible has served the Jewish life for nearly a thousand years. Tonight, in 30, 40 minutes or so, I want to bring an application to a piece of Brother Thomas's sacred wisdom, which I also understand that goes Francis of Assisi, uh, Wisdom, St. Francis of Assisi, whose items I was in the presence of not so many years ago in Assisi. I was blessed to know and enjoy occasional contact with Brother Thomas, thanks to Bernie and Sue, for 12 years prior to his passing, now 17 years ago. One of his favorite sayings went like this, and it's up on the screen. First you do what is necessary, then you do what is possible, and before you know it, you are doing the impossible. My application from my rabbinic background is based upon a profound belief tonight in the impressive potential of responsive living. That is, how our responsive abilities help us to live more effectively with the things that we don't get to control in life. Time for an illustration about the immense potential of being responsive. If you watch the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s unforgettable I Have a Dream speech in front of the Lincoln Memorial in August of 1963, you will note something surprising. It turns out that the first 11 minutes of his 16-minute address are delivered from a written text. It's inspiring, of course. But then something unplanned happens. The great singer Mahalia Jackson, standing near the podium, calls out, Tell me your dream, Martin. Dr. King pauses. Then he decides to depart, depart from his written text to words he knows by heart, to engage on a whole different level with the audience. What followed in those last five minutes became the history-changing I Have a Dream speech. The call and response energy intensified every time he exclaimed, I have a dream. Now, if somebody would have told you that one of the most soaring speakers
speeches in visually recorded history was launched as a response to a cue, in this case from the Hedy Jackson. You might have been surprised, but it was. And so, the point is, there is nothing timid or weak about our responses. Sure, being proactive, initiating, can be forceful. But responding well, that can launch you to, into the stratosphere. Much of my life as a rabbi, now 35 years in Boston, is about, has been about being responsive. I need to be, believe me. I need to recover from mistakes I make. More often than I want to admit, I need to. When I'm more effective at listening for the feelings of others, that is when I'm trying to meet them where they are, which is all about trying to be more responsive to them, I have a better chance of being helpful in meeting their needs. That dynamic, that interaction between me and somebody in my community, between me and you, right here and now, is what I want to talk about tonight. It's about more than a beach ball toss between your wishes and my offering. It's about more than the reflex Nick Epley says, some people wave, but everybody waves back. It's more than the yawning reflex, or even the tearful one. It goes antiphonally from one to another. I deeply believe it's what God had in mind when God made our bodies as vibrating entities. Consider the call and response going on inside you right now. Inhale, exhale. Your pulse. The switching stations from your brain to the systems that help you digest, breathe, and stay attentive. When we interact smoothly with what's going on all around us, the conversations, what shows up in our inboxes, the unplanned events in our wider world and in our personal world, from a biopsy result to a ter terrible event of global harm. When we get better at responding to what's going on all around us, then we're more in sync with the rhythms going on inside us. And when your responsive rhythms to things around you are more in sync with the rhythms inside you, you know that feeling. You feel cleaner, healthier, more as God designed you to interact with the world around you. And you know what? This also applies to how we respond to the person we meet in the mirror every morning. How we respond to ourselves when we're disappointed in ourselves, when we're struggling with how we chose to respond to a situation. This too is key to our well-being, that is, the capacity to respond is not only good for us, it's good for those around us. Spiritual goods come in many forms. Three of the most common, that is, three of the most commonly sought and divinely provided in my experience as a rabbi serving the community are energy, options, and clarity. When I sit with someone who feels lost, whether they're worn down, torn down, or let down, they may not know what they're looking for, but chances are high that it will include, number one, a pick-me-up in energy, moving the needle from empty to full. Number two, expanding avenues for them to pursue, let's call it, a more expansive, better view. Or number three, bringing sharper, more laser focus to their priorities and their purpose. 
one of these three will be among the spiritual goods, then a successful visit will find them walking away with. Tonight I want to meet you where you are, and I want to try and do this by recognizing that responsive living is much more an art than a science. And it's new for me tonight, and I thank Bernie and Sue and this art and spirituality lecture that honors, among others, Brother Thomas, that the, the, it is the art in art and spirituality that is this capacity to respond. And I just want to lift up a passage from a book by Bill Shore called The Cathedral Within. And the passage itself talks about one of the features of art. Roger Morici, toward the end of Bill's book, is quoted as saying, a stone carver is inclined to be an honest man. An executive may embellish his resume, but a stone carver's work is there for all to see. No matter how well he writes, he does not change the quality of his carving. Well, I'm going to come at you tonight with candor and honesty and recognize that just as artists like Brother Thomas were able to make beauty and that was very much a reflection, as Bernie said so beautifully, of the beauty within. My hope is that we'll get to know what beautiful, responsive living can do as an art form. And I want to humbly endeavor to bring some spiritual goods with the help of fellow travelers from kindred faiths as well as from my own to some of the most vexing challenges we face in today's world. With human dignity and human decency increasingly at risk, you don't need any reminders about a simple reality. The more we work at these challenges, somehow the messier they seem to get. And so, I want to suggest that responding to that reality three different ways might help us approach what's accrued thus far, what's stored thus far in more fruitful ways. The first point I want to raise is the importance of doing difficult things. We live in a time, and I know you know this, where it's increasingly convenient and easy to do things. And I'm all a fan of easy, especially if it can help things become more efficient. I have a friend who walks around with this thing, and he doesn't do a shopping list when he goes through his house to see when he needs more light bulbs or some more toilet paper or a refill of this item or that item, all he does is he hits his phone, takes a picture of a Q code or some sort of a computerized code, and it automatically places an order with something like Amazon, and it shows up at his door either 12 hours later or the latest 24 hours later. Easy and convenient has become a norm. But the problem, as you all know, is that when everything is easy, we actually lose our ability to be more adroit, adaptive, to do hard things. The capacity to have the wedding stone that sharpens us. And so, doing difficult things examining difficult texts in Scripture, being around difficult people, having difficult conversations about things that matter, 
This is a really important skill. And we need to dig deep to find the effort and the wherewithal to do hard things. The three different ways in which my tradition invites us to do the difficult is to, for the purpose of energy, number one, the first spiritual good, to look at wells. Wells are our go-to sources. They can be texts, they can be places in which we engage in a meditative monastic tradition, in nature. It can be deeds. But you all know what your wells are, and you know how important it is to continue to return to them, to plenish yourself when you're faced with something difficult. The second way, according to my tradition, is called paths. Paths are where the action is. It's where our works live. That's where we live with our emotions and, 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 and the challenges of time and mattering. I tend to recommend the way to widen and get a better view of the second spiritual good in a path is to use the word and a lot more than the word but. <laughs> and finally, the third metaphor for what we call Torah, the first five books of the Bible, is light. Light that is ambient. Infectious in a good way, it glows and has a soft glow. There's a concept in the Eastern European Hasidic tradition that when it's cold in a room, the concept is called a tzaddik in pelts, which is a righteous person in a fur coat. <laughs> it goes like this when it's cold in a room, there are two ways to get warm. One is to put on a fur coat, but when I print on a fur coat, only I'm warm. Another is to light a fire in the fireplace. When you light a fire in the fireplace, everybody's warm. So again, from the standpoint of the sources that help us with energy, options, and clarity, wells, paths, and light are three very, very important metaphors for Torah and places to go for when things are difficult. Let's see, I want to just share one more. This is in the Talmud from a book of sayings of our sages, and it says, According to the effort is the reward. What's the benefit of doing difficult things? What's the benefit of struggling? Let's say you're hoping that somebody will be able to understand what you're going through. But they're not really understanding. They're listening for your feelings. They're trying really hard. But they're not really getting what's going on inside you. But you know what? They're really breaking a sweat trying. They're really trying. And they continue to try. And they continue to work hard at it. And even though they may never actually say what is exactly going on, you appreciate the fact that they're trying so hard. Why? Because the effort shows how much they care. The other thing that happens with effort is that it adds weight and dignity. So I would just leave this first third of my presentation by saying that it's important to be doing some difficult things with some of the spiritual goods that our traditions offer us. Because this convenience is nice, Ease is the norm. Effort, we all know, is where we ultimately show how much we care and bring dignity to relationships. 
So now I want to go to the other passage from Thomas. Yes. And this passage from Brother Thomas relates to the things in our life that we don't control, which is most of it. The painter, writes Brother Thomas, puts on the last daub of paint. The sculptor chisels off the definitive chip of marble. The chef sifts in the final taste of herb and spices. But the potter, the potter is left to wait anxiously for his kiln to cool down to see what final changes the fire has left upon his work. They, the potter and the fire, are co-agents of this change about to reveal itself when the kiln door is opened. I love this idea that Brother Thomas often spoke of and the gifts of the fire, gifts from the fire, that we just don't know what's going to come until we open the door. And then as we know, Brother Thomas did the opposite of most artists, most potters. Instead of saving 90% and destroying 10%, he, of course, did the very opposite. But the other passage I just am very fond of, the fond of comes from uh, George Eliot, one of my favorite writers of late. George Eliot Wright wrote that basically control is an interesting thing. Given the mistakes mortals make when they have their own way, it's remarkable they're so fond of it. <laughs> now, she wrote that tongue-in-cheek because who wouldn't want your own way? We all want our own way, but even when we have it, other variables don't hold still. There are things that we don't realize that are in play. And having our own way isn't always as helpful as we want to think it is. There are unpleasant arrivals, things that knock us sideways, put us flat on our backs. I'm thinking not only about the passing of my father in recent years, back in August of 20, Sometime before that, back in 2016, my mom's sudden passing. Now normally the advice goes something like this. When you're not flat on your back by devastating news, the advice says something like, factor out what you can't control and focus on what you can. It's good advice, especially in an emergency. But tonight, for all of you, I want to suggest something very different. I want to factor in all the things you can't control. And that's what well-toned, responsive fiber helps you do. After all, most of what happened to you, even today, wasn't on your daily planner when your day began. Yeah, you knew what you were going to do, but you didn't know what the experiences were going to feel like. You didn't know in a meeting how the interaction was going to go. You didn't know what was going to come across the newswire. Well-toned, responsive fiber cushions. It's a shock absorber. It repurposes. It makes more of of what you meet in any given day go in your favor. The question I want to ponder, and I actually want to ask this question, and I'm interested in an answer or two, if you wouldn't mind. I'm not sure if this is the norm for this lecture, but I want to open it up, because I think it's, I'm going to ask you two questions that I consider to be decent enough questions the answers aren't self-evident. Why? Is the responsive mode to doing things we can't control such an important mode for God to school us in? 
It was why, just step away for a second, I'm curious, why did God make us internally, as I said before, for cue and response? And why does God seem to want us to get good at responding to things that show up in our life? And So, so one thing is, we God is calling us to be responsive to those things, and so beautiful point. Your name, Trace. Sister Trace, thank you. Sister Trace is saying something beautiful that we get our calling, essentially, in life from the things that we're called to respond to. Why is God showing me this? What can this teach me? Right? And that is a very, very powerful question. I love that. Any other thoughts about why God wants us to be so good at responding to stuff that we don't actually initiate? I'll give you one of mine. Because some of the most precious things in life aren't in our control. You don't get to decide if somebody else that you love, loves you. I remember I watched a, I listened to a podcast a year or so ago from Adam Grant, who's an organizational consultant, and Rachel Bosman, who's a trust guru. She's written a book <laughs> about trust. And the thing Adam Grant couldn't get out of his mind He's a type A personality, maybe a triple A personality, and he couldn't get out of his mind the fact that he had no control over whether somebody else trusted him. It's crazy. He could do everything he could to earn their trust. He could be trustworthy. He could bend over backwards in every example possible to be worthy of their trust, but ultimately the other person decides. So some of the most precious and treasured things in life depend on things we don't control. And God wants us to recognize that. Moreover, We actually depend on some of those things for our own flourishing. The way I like to put it is, stuff we don't control, the arrivals, can actually become a protein for our productivity. Take one example. Motivation. Drive. I often say to people who are struggling to be motivated. When you're motivated, any starting point will do. When you're not, none of them will. So what gets you going? It takes the need of somebody else. It takes somebody else telling you that in the moment they have a need and that's what gets you into gear. The bottom line, self-improvement is not a do-it-yourself activity, just as you all know in this magnificent place of the spirit, the self-made light, all on its own is too dim. So there are two takeaways so far, and now I'm going to get into some text in the final third. The difficult effort is essential. It's what Thomas was called, would call doing the necessary. Number two, being responsive to arrivals involves, from my perspective, 
Thomas doing the possible. Now I want to turn to the impossible. The things that we actually don't have the skills for right now. And I want to go to my Jewish traditional sources, two different biblical texts. Uh, the first is about Joseph's being in prison. Some of you remember the story in Genesis. And nothing in the Bible is accidental. Commentators like Rashi, whom I mentioned earlier, are always seeing every single detail, as you might know, as very purposeful. So Joseph has developed quite a prowess as a dream interpreter. And he has this amazing talent for interpreting dreams. So he's in prison, and there is a baker and a cupbearer. So the rabbis say, well, what's going on here? A baker and a cupbearer. And they make the following juxtaposition. They say, a baker needs the dough and gets ready to bake whatever they're going to bake. And if a fly lands on the dough, or even gets somehow mushed in, the baker simply removes the part and the fly and puts it in the oven and it bakes. And you have no problem. But somebody who mixes drinks, a cup bearer, has a nice glass of wine. And what happens if a fly lands in the glass of wine? Now you haven't noticed that all of a sudden you have this insect floating around in your wine. It's not going to come out, right? Because it's already sort of in there. You have to dump out the wine, right? So, so what the rabbis are saying is the difference between these two occupations is the difference between two different kinds of people. One person is controlling the recipe from the beginning to the end, that's the baker, but the cupbearer is the kind of person for whom a fly in the ointment could come along completely out of their control, completely out of their hands, and that person has to be adaptive, adroit, and has to have the ability to deal with the fly that comes into the ointment. Which would you prefer on your team? The person with the most raw talent? Or the person who is the best at growing? The person who is the most gifted? Or the person who has a, a highest talent for improvement? What the rabbis say is that Joseph represents the baker. He's in charge in Egypt. Of course, he also introduces servitude in Egypt. But Joseph's descendants in the biblical flow of things become the ten lost tribes. Joseph becomes Ephraim, associated with the northern kingdom and they're conquered by the Assyrians in 721, and we never hear from them again. Who's the other brother who's an important leader? It's Judah. Judah is the one who steps up. By the way, we name a religion. Mine, for Judah. Judaism, right? And the tribe of Judah Lasts. That's where Jerusalem is. Judaism survives. And what the rabbis are basically saying in this difference between the, cup bear, the baker and the cupbearer is that the key to being able to have a talent for growth is the idea of Judah, the idea of the cupbearer. Now, that's the first step. I just want to, by the way, ponder one thing in all of this, an important point that is easy to miss. And I don't know whether this is going to get me trouble here or not, but you'll tell me what you think about.
about it. I tend to think that God prefers to not call attention to God's self in the world. In other words, God's very active in my life. God's very active in the world. I have no doubt about that whatsoever. But God is not constantly opening and closing the draperies and the shutters to try to call to command and sue for our attention in a conspicuous way. If that were the case, a lot of other people in the world would probably be forced to have to respond to those conspicuous calls. But God actually prefers that most of God's works are harder to detect. God wants it more subtle. And the second, the last question I want to ask you is, if you buy that theory, why does God want God's influence to be harder to detect? Why does God want God's presence? God would rather have us appreciate our abilities, perhaps, but why to put it, I think, the way I once heard it in a conversation with Heschel years ago, God, why do you make it so hard to find you? Right? So the question is why? If you buy the idea itself. Any thoughts about why God doesn't hit everybody over the head with a sledgehammer and say, here I am, what's wrong with you, right? Why does God prefer the subtlety and not calling attention to God's self? Any thoughts? Yeah, please. Uh, because then the potential exists in everything we see to discern. Right. Beautiful, beautiful. What's your name? Yeah. And thank you. Thank you. The potential for God... What, I'm sorry, what? I said one of the ends. One of the ends. I love it. Thank you. Uh, so, it, you know, if, if God were insisting here and now, in this moment, that we pay attention, that would leave out a lot of other moments and a lot of other places. I love that. love that. Any other thoughts? I, I, I want to add one of my own, in addition to help us instill the capacity, our self-belief, a belief in our own capacity to grow and to improve, sort of the way that Cupbearer and Judah do in that story. But I also think it's to convey something else. God doesn't call so much attention to God's self because God doesn't want us to see our relationship with God as purely transactional. We don't strive to get rewards when we engage in a relationship with God. We discover them. That's good faith. We don't strive to get the rewards. We discover them after the fact. It's good faith and it's particularly good when we discover them and they belong, they fit neatly and handsomely inside us. In such cases, that kind of discovery feels more like a recovering. More like an emotional homecoming. I think God also wants us to come to realize that unnoticed things are not timid things. Return with me once more to how your body is built to work. There's nothing timid about a beating heart, about all your functioning organs. If you're like me, you only notice your organs when they aren't working the way they've worked in the past. It's a very powerful notion that the things that we notice less can have immense, monumental, life-giving capacity. And here I'm going to go to
to another source, not necessarily a source from our tradition, but I thank Bernie for giving me this source years ago from a book called Senza. This comes from an African mother who's sending her daughter to college in America, actually in Boston, in Cambridge. And she's a little worried that her daughter is going to forget where she comes from. And so as the daughter is getting to, ready to leave, she tells her daughter what her mother once told her. Quote, You will meet only two men in your life. One will make you your hands tremble, the other will make them steady. The first will be your passion of youth, but like the blazing fires of the bush, it will soon die to glowing embers and cool ashes. The second will enter your life quietly, like a thief in the night. It will be like the mighty trees of the forest that we do not see before us, but they are there, strong and tall, in rain and sun. They dig their roots deep and shade us with their leaves. It is the second one you must marry. You will be a good husband and father to your children. I think a relationship with God is very much like that second one. It's subtle, it's not flashy. It allows for aligning the rhythm of what's within us with what's around us and above us. And that, when we do that, that actually feels a little bit like a private miracle. Even when we're faced with fatal limitations confronting our mortality, I want to share with you another passage from the second century rabbinic sage. We read about this on our liturgy, we pray it in our Yom Kippur, holiest day of the year. We talk about the martyrs, the people who lost their lives because they refused to deny their Judaism during Adriatic persecutions. One martyr in particular was literally wrapped with a scroll of Torah. He was burning, the Torah was burning, and he described to his disciples, the parchment was consumed, but the letters blossomed in the air. Why does it say blossom? The Hebrew word is porchot. It often gets translated as the letter, the, the parchment was consumed, but the letters were floating in the air. But it doesn't say floating, it says flowering. It says flowering because it implies that there is growth, learning, the cupbearer, Judah, the capacity to have a talent for responding and improving with each swing of the bat, if you will. And now I want to come to the final text tonight. It's uh, a text that's associated with how Jacob, the third of our forefathers, becomes Israel. You all know the story. Jacob is wrestling with a mysterious being through the night. We're not quite sure who it is. Some say it's the angel of Esau, his brother. Some say it's God. But dawn is breaking and the angel asks to be released. It's a very painful ordeal. It's one where Jacob dis has his hip dislocated, sort of an extreme version of sciatica, if you will. And the figure says, release me, dawn is breaking. And Jacob says, in the Hebrew, it's lo'ash lachachachi be'erachtani, 
I refuse to release you, Jacob says, until you bless me, which I take to mean I refuse to part company from this ordeal until I can extract something positive from it. It's a worldview. I refuse to part company from this ordeal until I can extract something positive from it. It may take a while, but you get to decide what can be done to make a bad thing better. This final point rests heavily on time. And by the way, time is something we don't control. And by the way, we seem to coexist with it relatively well. We can sanctify it, we can choose how to apportion it, what to imbue it with. Bernie, as you said, is that my own being present here, right here and now, with each and every one of you. This constellation of people, these rare souls each of you are, will never actually constitute itself exactly this way again. So we appreciate the singularity of this moment. But time is something that we can't stop, we can't reverse, we can't know the future. It's completely out of our control, but that doesn't prevent us from responding well to it. The essential ingredients of how Jacob becomes Israel and says, I refuse to part company from this ordeal until someday I can extract something positive from it are three. First, you have to give your emotions their due. That may take a while. It certainly can't be rushed. That's the second point. And then finally, third point, when the time feels right, you determine to respond in a way that turns the end of this story into the middle of another one. That's how you do the impossible. As you're doing, by the way, art is about doing, right? It's about doing deeds, including the difficult. It's about staying responsive, toning and strengthening the responsive core. And finally, it's about patience with time, a patient belief in your ability to turn the end of one story into the middle of another one. This is doing the impossible. And that's what we're called to do. And it's a lot more art than science. Just like people are math problems challenges in our world require more than struggling artists to take on the important responses. May we discover how much more nourishing it feels not to just try to prove ourselves, but to improve ourselves. With the help of spiritual goods from wells, like energy, the paths we walk, abundant spaciousness, and from the light that provides laser focus on our purpose and our priorities. And may we rise kindly to respond to that call, and in so doing, may we discover and share in the blessings that come from the art of bringing spiritual goods to life. Dear God, may this be in keeping with your will, and let us now respond with the most responsive word ever uttered.